I'm your speaker, David Brown, and founder of Principal Consultant, D. Brown Consulting. And we have, um, I've been using Power BI, Excel, and business intelligence tools for over 22 years. And we we are D. Brown Consulting. We are also members of ATD, Association for Talent Development, and we've been providing training and talent development to thousands of people, especially in Nigeria, but also around the world. And Today, we have a very special guest that's going to be our course presenter. Our co presenter today is Mr. Gabriel. And Mr. Gabriel Nwake for is the head of LD for head of, head of Diamond Academy. And uh, he's going to be our guest today. So, we're going to be talking. I'll tell you about the topic. Of course, you've seen the topic itself. And I'll just see if my guest can hear me. Um, Gabriel, are you there? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a quick video. This just gives you an idea of what we're going to talk about today, because one of the best uh, recruiters, or one of the best recruiters or hiring you know, that hires is Google. And Google has quite a bit of examples to share with us. And let's just see how Google rules when it comes to hiring employees. Let's just have a look at that. All right, so that was Google. Now we're going to look at a few things. Let me just quickly jump straight through to the presentation. So we, we are going to talk about skills gap in the workplace and give you an overview of causes, uh, causes of skills gap in the workplace. Five powerful, powerful tips for identifying and closing skills gaps in the workplace. We'll do a small Q&A. And then, of course, if we can get our speaker uh, on so they can hear us then, some of the resources we have, and I will talk about a competency model that uh, we've built at Brown Consulting to help close that skills gap. And then we'll talk about what the next webinar is. So that's the framework for it. Please try and type a, a lot of stuff in the chat. You can type in the chat and ask any questions. Since at least the chat works, we'll be able to uh, get feedback from you from there, and we'll also give you feedback. All right, so skills gap in the workplace. How many of us here can say that they know whether or not there is a, actually a skills gap in their workplace. So uh, let me send, give you a poll and just see if we think there is a skills gap in our workplace right now. There's a poll coming up now for you to answer. But before before I send that poll, um, I want to actually see how many L and D people we have in the house. So just to know um, our audience, how many of you are learning and development experts? Hmm, 50, 50, call a friend, okay, 33%, 50. So keep the answers coming in. How many of you are L&D experts? Good afternoon, I'm sure everyone is there. So it seems that our audience, there are 25% of them are L&D experts, and 90%, uh, no, 75% of them are not. So we have quite a lot of people interested in L&D, but uh, maybe you have one or two things to tell them on how your career started. And okay, good afternoon, everybody, and um, it's good to be here. Um, well, um, like you said, um, I've been in the talent development space for a while, at least more than 10 years, and um, it's, been, it's been quite interesting. Um, so uh, going from core HR space to, to now, you know, learning and development 
is something that uh, is quite interesting, but it's been, it's been challenging. But the thing is that you, you need to be very creative, especially in today's world with the, with the changes that we see, fast paced changes in, uh, you know, L and D space and uh, be able to use technology, you know, your dexterity to using technology will always help you in the L and D space. And um, there are also resources, being able to do some research and quickly adapt resources you know, available to you, uh, you know, would, uh, you know, help you. So uh, that's just the word that's, I have to That's very on. cool. So I, mm -hmm. as HR, as an HR expert, I mean, you are HR expert for, I should guess, almost 15 years before yeah. joining l and fully, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, is it, uh, since you're in that side, you're the one that kind of recruits, so you recruit talent. Is it a different perspective when you're now an L and D person fully as a, as against the HR person? Are there things you thought you saw or you knew when you were HR, but now that you're fully in L and D, you now understand them better, or, or could you give us the contrast between HR and L and D? Uh, really, there's not much contrast because um, is uh, they're interwoven. So there's no sharp contrast between L and D and core. HR knowing fully well that um, it's one person and that mm -hmm. you're managing this person from the time the person comes in. For instance, I believe that uh, talent management is not just that process. It starts from mm -hmm. when you are acquiring talent up to the time what they call from cradle to you know your exit. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> so it, it is um, is I don't see I see it as one body. Mm. Yeah, because if if you begin to look at it as oh they are different, you will miss it. So you won't be able to have a value pro employee value proposition that will be meaningful to you know yeah. every you know individual in the system. So okay, okay. Yeah. So we we have we're going to be talking about five steps or five very cool tips for mm -hmm. kind of managing that uh, talent. And everybody says there's a skills gap, there's a talent gap. So skills gap in the workplace. Let me move on. Um, I would like to ask the audience if they think there they actually ha is a skills gap in the workplace. Oh, well, I think there's a unanimous agreement, uh, Gabriel. Uh, there really is a skills gap in the workplace. And uh, so yeah. we, we all agree there is. Now, typically, employers are frantic, frantic about trying to solve this problem of skills gap in the workplace. And there's just a few statistics I will share. And then maybe you can also tell us how you um, have, have dealt with this. They, um, in Europe, I mean, they did a study and they study of about 41,700 hiring managers in 42 countries, and 38% of them agreed, confirmed that they have serious difficulties filling jobs. And what do you think the percentage is in Nigeria? I'm, I'm thinking it should, be, it should be higher, right? That 38%. Yes, it, it should, yes. Yes, because uh, it's, I, I know as an employer myself that it's, it's extremely difficult to get highly skilled people, and you need to re- that which is the whole idea of you developing your people yourself. I mean, you just need to develop your people because they don't come in with all the skills in the first place. So that talents, the, the five powerful tips I want to share on identifying and closing skills gap in the workplace is very critical. Another statistic is a survey was conducted by Gallup in 2015 and they pulled uh, that only 50% of employees knew what was expected of them at work. Just 50% of employees actually knew what was expected of them. I don't know, what, what's, what do you think of this statistic, Gabriel? Is there any similarities with what you've seen in your um, long and illustrious career? Um, yes, um, and it goes more from the point of even communicating what is expected of employees. And, you know, managers, uh, you know, hand-holding their employees and actually communicating to, communicating to them what's expected of them. So this is a, is a major challenge, it's a major communication challenge, and um, mm. which we see in the workplace, yeah. And do you think it's more to do with HR processes not being followed and the companies just working or winging it, uh, uh, so to say, like a one-man kind of business? Um, well, um, to some extent, the the HR practice uh, that is not being followed, but again, the, the, the that, our managers may not be properly, you know, prepared for, you know, handling such, uh, you know, positions. I mean, I work in an industry today where you, you find out that people get promoted to the point of, um, you know, due to their technical skills. So they go mm -hmm. up there 
and um, they are far wanting. And that is why in my industry today, leadership development has become a major, major, you know, um, aspect of the work we do. Okay. I think so, I kind of... Yeah. That because technical skills, yes, they're good. But when it comes to when you're going up in an organization, you need people skills. You need a yes. real big dose of people skills, managing people, because you're not supposed to be doing the operational technical work. You're supposed to be managing, encouraging, and motivating people, leading people to change. Yeah, so I think I can, uh, I can agree with that fully. All right, so first tip, going down the tips now we have five tips for you the first tip is identifying company objectives so identifying company objectives is the very first tip now why would we think that it's important to identify company objectives it's just like planning anything i mean when you're goal setting you're trying to set a goal you need to understand what's the objective what exactly do i want to get out of this and so to me this is a very important tip uh, identifying company objectives and I guess it starts with your mission and vision as a company itself and then it now whittled down down to everybody and they have their specific objectives I, I, I don't know um, Gabriel could you share do you know share something about this tip around your experience I'm um, sure yeah uh, one of the things that we notice is that um, you know people being able to understand the vision and um, you know the objectives of the organization is um, usually a challenge Sometimes because of how these are being communicated, and sometimes there's no communication actually. So they're on the pages of, um, you know, uh, documents that lie there. So sometimes people are not able to connect the dots. Um, again, it is important for as HR practitioners, as L and D, you know, practitioners, that people begin to look beyond. For instance, sometimes people don't look at their strategic documents to actually know what is there, what is short term, what's medium term and what's long term now the industries industry will be changing but we'll still be doing the same thing okay giving you an example in today when we think about in my industry banking if i think about my competition today i should be thinking about the fintechs i should be thinking about telecommunications so that means that yeah. eventually the objectives of of what we are doing i mean it's changing because these are the people we are competing with and therefore the skills required Will be different. So I'm interviewing one uh, uh, one geek somewhere, and um, is no more the the typical. So you come into the, the the banking space, you find out that you need people from different uh, you know um, industries or skills from different uh, you know industries to join uh, you know banking. But sometimes we HR people don't get it, so we continue to do the same thing, begin to look for the same type of people that will not deliver. You know the i mean for the future of the company so that's mm. what i see so it's the ability yeah. of people to actually understand that the business is moving and where the business is going we must be able to um, understand where the business is going and be able to identify the gaps that we have in-house and begin to build on you know uh, equipping our people for for the business ahead mm. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, let's let's move on. So uh, company objectives is key. I agree, hundred percent. I mean, you can't uh, you can't be excel if you don't even know where you're going. It's like a road. You need to know the path, and then you follow that path. Now, just like someone said, budgeting. That what's the point of budgeting? That if you budget, at the end of the day, you're going to have a variance. Why budget? The idea of budgeting is you have a path. You have a goal. You set a goal. Yeah, you may not reach it, but at least you have something to expect. You have something, a path to follow. It's very important. All right, so that's excellent first tip. Our second tip is a survey. We need to survey current employees. We need to survey current employees. Why would we need to survey current employees? Um, someone may, may ask that question. And why? why? Any, any ideas why, sir? Uh, why would we need to survey current employees? Okay, fine. Um, the current employees are actually the holders of the of the job, and they know where. They say the man that wears the shoe knows where you know it uh, you know pinches. So, if you want to identify how well people understand where the organization is going, how well people understand what is expected of them, then it is the incumbent that you have to uh, you know solve it to to get you know information that is uh, you know valid. Um, it's going and to be most like time, an anonymous survey or 
it will be just a general survey everyone knows is it how how, no, do, you, well, how do you survey okay for for me um i would make it uh, i would make it anonymous because you're talking to the person and everybody should be sold into you know um the what the organization wants to do at any given point in time so i will make it a specific survey and uh, using the technologies that are available the survey monkey and all the rest of them so you can use any of that you can also use you know other forms of survey some organizations also uh, come up with their own uh, you know platforms for survey and um you will get you know the the, the type of um you know information that you require to show you whether people actually understand um, you know what is expected of them to make you understand where they are they, they fall short of and not the rest of them okay i i can attest to that because one of our courses that we do i'll give you a small story you know, my own experience too when we uh, started doing some technical courses uh, we teach a lot of excel financial modeling and the rest and we decided we're going to do needs analysis a detailed needs analysis for our clients so we created a survey on one of these tools i think it was called daddy and uh, we did a detailed survey or a test, really, a competency test for our um, staff of the organization. And they were pretty shocked. It caused a stare in the company because most of them thought they knew, and it was on Excel. Most of them thought they knew Excel, and they realized that, that they don't. And then there's one or two quiet people that they know work very efficiently at the corner, and their own results were excellent. They had the highest scores. And they're like, okay, we kind of now understand where our competency gaps are. And uh, others that they thought were really good were not that good. So it caused a, a stir in the organization. But surveys are very key, and uh, especially when they are done right. There are certain rules or ways we survey. Now, for our audience, our audience, um, we asked them just now, have you ever carried out a competency survey for your employees? And 70% of them have. So that's a very good number. This typical, would you think that that's a surprising? It's surprising to me that seventy percent have. What about you, sir? Yeah, fine. Um, it's it's okay. We do lots of surveys. Uh, provider is not ticking the box, and mm -hmm. as other professionals in the room, I will have to tell us. Um, sometimes what we do, what we use surveys for, uh, you know, is very important because if you don't use your surveys, uh, you know, constructively. It means that, I mean, for this year, it means that next year when you bring it up, employees will just uh, be careless about how they respond to it, knowing fully well. So it's, it's important that we take note of that when we are doing, um, you know, surveys. And as much as possible, when you're doing surveys, don't make it, depending on the, on the, your organization, you know, you, you may, not, you must have to make sure that you make it as simple as possible and as straightforward as possible so that people can respond to it and move on to, other things they they have to do so okay so that's the risk some people yeah. do it just to tick a box have you done a survey yes yeah. and they, they take it so instead of actually getting the benefit of doing it okay i i, I get that so 60 percent uh, final poll results uh, 60 percent of us or oh, it's even going up again 64 percent have actually carried out a competency survey yes but as gabriel said it's not just a matter of ticking the boxes there's a lot of planning that goes into this yes it's an important step it's an important tip but a lot of planning goes into that as well so if we do surveys then who which tools are we currently using um so i'll ask another question which tools are we using for these surveys but i'll give you a list of tools that are typical in the marketplace and uh, these are some tools that are out there some of them are very uh, some of them are free and uh, well, so just which tools you currently use. So if you can type it into the chat, guys, tell me which tools you use for your surveys. Just type all that into the chat. What are the tools you currently use? So SurveyMonkey is a very popular one. I, uh, we use PollDaddy, there's some polling uh, so tool called PollDaddy, PollDaddy.com. That, that's pretty cool. I think we've uh, tested or surveyed about 4,000 people with that. And yeah, so it's, 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 cool that we have these tools before the internet what were we doing i mean gabriel before the internet what were you doing how were you how are you conducting these huge surveys well uh, well i tell you what as far back as uh, my days in the uh, um, resource and it firm i developed something that we were using excel to do it was a smaller company of about 100 people but we were using it uh, so we asked the right questions and stuff like that. And uh, we got, uh, you know, the right feedback, actually. 
Um, but again, it's also a different industry. So people were more upfront. You know, when you work with the millennials, for instance, you find out today they are more upfront than just telling you the way it is, you know, with the innocence of a child. And um, so <laughs> that, that helped us. So we're using Excel yeah. then, but all we needed to do was to link several sheets into uh, the global sheet that gives us the results immediately. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Interesting. We we use Excel a lot as well. I think Excel is a very very useful tool. It's kind of underutilized in the in the workplace. So I'm yes. seeing the chat now. People Moodle Moodle. Okay, Moodle is an LMS, and I, maybe it has a survey tool attached to it. I'm not sure. Uh, Temito um, Ade Ade Barry said they use Moodle. Uh, Temito Pue is a survey monkey, and some survey tools was developed in house. Oh, Fumi, I think a survey tool was developed in house. I think Fumi is an icon. We use a survey tool in house, which is interesting. So, IT guys actually developed a survey tool from scratch. Now, another thing, a uh, uh, very important tip. So, the next tip really is once you survey, you, you have a plan. Yes, you've surveyed to see what everybody's thinking. But then there's one very key set of stuff that you need to identify. And that is tip three. So step three is you need to determine the A players in your organization. So the A players are the ones that obviously imbibe that culture. They, they have a clear understanding of the objectives and they are performing. So that means they're performing according to plan. Now, it will be important, in my opinion, to identify those A players because they're like mentors, they're potential mentors to any B or C player to kind of pull them up to become A players as well. So it seems that they connected the dots. Now, I, I, that's my general understanding. But, but what, what would you have to say about this tip, Gabriel? Yeah, fine. Uh, this is a very important aspect of, uh, you know, identifying, you know, gaps and filling gaps because the A players uh, who in my organization will call high potentials or people call them high pots, actually the people that understand and connect the dots, like you said. So being able to identify them, it means that you need to actually categorize your employees into the different buckets. Some have five buckets, uh, some have uh, high potential, some have uh, expert talent, some have um, you know blockers and all the rest of them. And then make sure that you identify the unique capabilities or the unique uh, traits of the A players, because it's actually these unique traits of the A players, the things that made them successful that you're actually going to draw up as a way or, or as, a, as, a, as a model for even recruiting new people when they come in. So you need to check before you go and bring in somebody who cannot measure up to your A player to now supervise your A player. This is one problem oh, yeah. that, mm -hmm. you know, we have. And then you, you cause a lot of problems, you know, within your team or in the organization yes yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so it's a recruitment issue as well so uh, when you're recruiting and uh, also kind of this like a special uh, spice something they do that just makes it work and if they can share that secret with everybody else then uh, everybody else will move up so i think there's this uh, story about the best salesman in the world or i don't know if you've heard about that salesman that sold cars and he he was yes. he, considered as the best ever salesman and all, all he did well, most of what he did his secret really was almost like empathy to his employees his 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 clients his customers when they when they buy from him he gets their details gets their birthdays and he sends them cards every single every single year sends them like a new year card thank you very much for being my customer and over the years just you can imagine you are thinking of buying a car and you you just see this card from this guy saying thank you very much uh, I'm so i'm so happy that you are you're my customer hope the car is doing well if you want to buy a new car if you want to replace your car who will you go to you go straight to that guy so some things like sure. that um, that uh, i don't think you can teach in class uh, is what the a players will bring to the table and say okay these are the techniques we are using and uh, i think you should also imbibe it so so that's a very key um, tip and let's move on to the next one. So the next tip, or before I move on to the next one, these are just some statistics about being A players. It's obviously, the survey uh, will confirm your A players to you. So an A player could become a mentor, as I mentioned, to your um, underperforming staff. And then having a strategic plan around that will also help. And maybe those that are not really A players, maybe there's just job rotation that you need. Yeah, so... 
So that's that's one or two things. Let's see if we can move on to tip uh, four. So tip four is innovation. Now that's a word that many people kind of uh, bounce around: innovation, innovation. And uh, when you ask someone, okay, define innovation, a lot of them don't really understand what it means. It's just a nice word. Is innovate uh, innovation? So how do I innovate in a company? We just sell noodles. I mean, what innovation can I? can I come up with in by selling noodles? But I, I think it's a, a really key tip and it's just a context change. We need to understand what context. So I don't know what context you would put place innovation. Uh, Gabriel, would you, would you try and help us with that as far as I'm concerned? Yeah, for Closing me, you know, gap. sure, in it, for, uh, for any uh, manager, for any uh, business leader, should be able to uh, recognize innovation and it's not just about the big ticket innovations. It could be something as simple as, you know, developing a new template for, you know, checking your work and all the rest of them. Supporting, uh, you know, the, the, the enterprise in whatever way. So, uh, and again, to, in today's world, innovation is, is, the, is the key word because everything is changing so fast. So that means people must be able to be agile and adapt to, you know, new behaviors, not, not necessarily new technologies, it's not the same thing as buying a new iPhone or the iPhone X, like some people say, but what did you do with your iPhone 7? How much of it were you able to utilize? So it's important that people continue to innovate, continue to change the way they do things, you know, identify new ways of doing things and then apply it to uh, their day-to-day, -day, you know, tasks and also to even the long term goals of the you know organization yes and you mentioned something previously about millennials you're saying that they come come to the workforce with a completely different set of mindsets this reminds me sure. of a mckinsey study in 2015 they conducted research on about 365 public companies across uh, north america and i think the uk mm -hmm. as well and the study found gender diverse companies were 50 percent more likely to outperform companies in the bottom quartile of diversity mm -hmm. so just by having a gender diversion having more women in the workplace obviously and then also uh, youth as in having a, a kind of diversity of age in the workplace as well so that kind of um, bringing people that are younger with new ideas and then older i can remember a tweet tweet that say, said that why do we employ oh, this is a bit political but why do we all our leaders are older, are much older than the average age. This is across the world. But of course, Africa is yeah. even worse. So your average age of yeah. Nigerians is 18. The, the average age is 18.3 years. But the average age of our leaders is usually 70 something to, to 80. Uh, well, the older you are, the more wisdom, I agree. But I think the young can actually give us a, a little bit more diversity and innovation. Or what do you think, sir? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, every day people talk about the millennials. Uh, it has mm -hmm. become like uh, a buzzword for, especially for us HR professionals. But if you ask people, what specific programs do you have to make sure that the millennials are engaged? Is still nothing to write home about. So they still drop policies on the on the millennials. They still want them to to be the same fashion, the same way that they are and these guys are telling you no that's not what that's not what it means we want to be engaged and not dress them so for us mm -hmm. uh you know in the in the academy today we we, we started the uh, diversity and inclusion uh you know program which we have infused into our learning and um mm -hmm. so we, we are we, uh, this we're going to launch very soon and um we want to give them an opportunity um the the those uh, people that are ordinarily um, are excluded from, you know, some of these, um, you know, the, the things that the, the policies and some of the programs that traditionally the organization has. So we want to give them an opportunity to become ambassadors, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for for us. And I think that will yeah. better engage them more. Nice, nice. Some people look at Google and they look at Facebook and they look at all that and see, okay, you have uh, table tennis tables in there in the office, unconventional office design and uh, yeah, a gym and all that kind of stuff. Do you, do you think that's important too, to kind of uh, generate innovative spirit or make people think out of the box? Is, it, is, that, is that important in the future workplace? Is this something we can do in Nigeria? 
Yeah, I mean, there's no, no stopping us in Nigeria, honestly, because it's the same, everybody is reading from the same hymn book today, because we have access to the same internet, we have access to the same information anybody has. And um, so it, it behoves on, um, you know, managers to begin to learn new ways of managing, you know, people. Uh, those days are gone when you say, okay, uh, do this memo and send it to me. So what prevents you from going to your, 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 your staff's desk and uh, correct that memo there and send it out? So mm -hmm. what prevents you from doing that? Why must you sit you know, in your office and say, send me this memo? And you know, sometimes it's also bad for the millennials. They get frustrated because they, they, they are looking up to somebody to tell them how to do something. But then uh, instead of uh, telling them, okay, this is what my expectations are in terms of uh, you know, this information that you're supposed to send to me. Now they find themselves going back and forth. So you, they send to you, you send back to them and stuff. You continue to do that. And that's not what these guys want. You know, again, mm -hmm. you want the millennial to read a 350, uh, 350-page document. There's no way the guy is going to read that. So in the learning space, you know, you find out that you are actually going to give them the learning in bits at the time they want it and, uh, you know, make it so relevant uh, to them, um, you know, always. And that is the concept of, uh, you know, um, you know uh, e-learning e and online learning. Uh -huh. So yeah, today... So Austin, you, you, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, sir. Continue today. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I said today you find out that you are the, 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 the mobile learning, for instance, has restricted the volume of documents and the way you present your documents, you know. So, yes. you know, those days are gone. And so we need to engage the millennials, you know, mm -hmm. make them incorporate them into the workplace. Yes. Nice. So the skills gap, as in Gade, we're talking about skills back in the work, uh, workplace and how to close that skill gap. And we first tip we gave you is you first of all need to identify company objectives. First of all, really identify company objectives before you can even measure and think about having uh, reducing skills gaps. And then the second tip was survey current employees. You need to understand where they are currently. Where are they before you now know how big the gap is, you know, even if there is a gap that you need to now uh, cover. And then the third tip was determine the A players in your organization. The A players are the ones that have a very, very low, the, the gap, gap doesn't really exist for them. So how do they do it? What are the things they're doing differently? And then the fourth point was innovation. You need very innovative ways of managing that skills gap. And we've talked about millennials and to take advantage of those millennials. I would kind of advise, uh, give everyone a tip if you can go online to even understand millennials a little bit more because millennials don't stay. When they come, go somewhere and they're not happy, they leave. And I think um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a video online by um, one, or oh, his name escape, escapes me now, where he, he used almost like dopamine. He explained about dopamine and the dopamine rush that uh, teenagers and, and millennials get when, when they send a tweet or they send a WhatsApp and they get somebody sending them back a, a smiley face. They get all those dopamine rushes. And when they come to the workplace, they're like, reality check. There's no tweets. There's no smiley face. Uh, that's, they, they just can't understand what happened to them. Now, let me give you an example. We can use WhatsApp in the workplace. I'm not too sure. But WhatsApp is pretty good. But Microsoft, for example, has Yammer. So for a lot of people that use Office 365, um, Yammer is a very good, it's free. If you have Office 365, you most likely have Yammer. Just take it as WhatsApp, official WhatsApp. And if you're communicating with the, your workforce that way, it's probably easier and faster because a lot of skills gap is communication gap. And the skills gap come a lot because of communication. And if you can fix that and fix it in a way that is very easy to use, like a simple chat tool like uh, Yammer, I think that will go a long way. Google is always the top, top player when it comes to uh, uh, companies for us to kind of measure up against. And if you know about DISC, DISC is another way of measuring whether someone is passive, active, task-oriented, or people-oriented. And I think having a mix of these people is very important. There's no best. There's nobody that's a B is better than I or better than C or better than S. The key thing there is understanding that you need different people with different mindsets, different likes. When they all come together, innovation blossoms. So that's one key uh, thing we need to look at. So if all of this don't work, what can we do? You've, you've identified your company objectives. You've done your survey. You've determined your A players. You've done all everything about innovation. You have a good mix of uh, uh, 
you have a good mix of young and old, male and female, and also someone social and everything. But still, still, there are skills gaps. So what do we do? Well, if after doing all this four and there are still skill, skill gaps, then you most likely need to hire. So that's the last tip, your hiring process. And in that hiring process, you also need to do it properly. That hiring process in a way that actually covers that skills gap. So and we're so lucky to have Gabriel here because Gabriel is an HR expert as well as an L&D expert, two expertise, and he's spent a de almost more than a decade in, in, in both. I mean, almost 20 years experience. So um, could you share the hiring process when it comes to covering skills gaps, Gabriel? Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> for me, the hiring process should stand on a tripod and um, you look at um, building capacity from the base, which is your graduate trainees. Uh, these are your people that you start building from the scratch. Then you have to also build capacity from within. So this, you have to have a mix of, uh, you know, learning, coaching and get people to move around because you can also hire from within. So that means you move people to other jobs or interview people for other jobs. And then you now do the targeted recruitment, which is your bringing from outside. Most importantly is that when, when you're bringing people from outside, they must be worth it. There is no need going to bring somebody that your A player or your B player is, is better than, honestly, because that's where the problem you know starts. And then when you're hiring, you must be very careful. It's not about, for instance, if I'm hiring, um, um, somebody for L and D to, in today's world, then the person must be high on technology bias. So I don't, I don't bother myself with oh he spent how many years you know manning uh, the training school of one organization. No, I can actually decide to go to you know a, a smaller organization and you know people that are doing new things in L and D and then uh, you know recruit the people. Then That's again, for those of us that. Yeah, the, for those of us that are, okay, for instance, I'll give you an example. There was a time in, in, in when people, when in my industry, when we went into direct sales. So you find out that you can only recruit people from um, um, FM, FMCGs. You can only recruit people from um, uh, the Red Stars of this world, the UPS of this world to fill the space, because they understood what direct sales is all about. So mm. again, if you're recruiting, the, if your organization is has a wide geographical spread, you have to be very careful the way you recruit people. In some parts of Nigeria, if you go there to recruit and you're putting your advert on the pages of the newspaper or you're looking for the person on LinkedIn, you may not find that person. You may wow. generally go to a place and paste the, the, the advert inside one funny place and you get people. However, LinkedIn has become a very, <laughs> has become an I mean, a place that people also recruit from. Social media recruitment is also very high. So, for instance, you you can go to uh, even in terms of checking people's uh, you know profiles and what they do and what their interests are. So you can go to any social media and find out about somebody that you are about recruiting. Oh, so also internal internal re references in terms of you know recommending people new hires and others is also very important so some people have all these employee recruitment uh, rewards and not just them for instance if you if you're able to uh, introduce somebody that is um, you know comes in and the person is very uh, good on the job and stuff like that or is an a person then you get a reward for that and stuff like that so you, there are a whole lot of things you can do. It depends on the situation you find yourself, and it depends on the type of person you are recruiting, um, or the type of skill you are recruiting for. That, that's really cool. So hiring is key, but there must be a plan around it. You need you can't just hire. Mm -hmm. I mean, you obviously have to have your gaps understood, and then you are hiring to fill that gap. And you mentioned some things that you said. Don't bring in somebody that's not good or even better than your A player. I mean, you, you, your yeah. A player also needs to learn. I mean, your A player is looking forward to learning from somebody. So you better bring somebody better and better and, and learn. So managers, very good managers, get people better than them. I think yeah. you, you, if you're not getting someone better than you, there's absolutely no learning going on. Well, excellent. So yeah. Google, one, let, let's quickly play a very short video that kind of demonstrates that recruitment process. So I'd like us to play, the, play a quick video 
and then we'll have a quick chat around that video and then i'll recap the five uh, skills or the five tips for you and then i'll show you something we do to kind of help hr understand certain competency gaps and we'll see that after small businesses can find the recruitment process a daunting prospect selecting the right person depends on following a series of distinct steps this gives you a simple process that you can use no matter what type or level of position you want to fill. The process also ensures that your recruitment is efficient, effective and fair. Let's look at each of these steps briefly. The first step is defining the role. You've made the decision that you need to take someone on and that the best option is to have someone directly employed in your business. Before you rush off to find someone, think carefully about what the role is the actual requirements of the job and how it fits into your business and your future plans. Write a job description to help you clarify the purpose, tasks and responsibilities of the job. Use a job description template to help guide you. And remember, this is about the job, not the person. The next step is to build a profile of the ideal person to fill this role. Again, there's a template and guidance available to help you. A person's specification will help you undertake the selection and interview process in a systematic way. The next step is attracting applicants. You need to start the search for suitable candidates. Think about where you can advertise to attract a wide range of good quality applicants. You're aiming to get the best response at the least cost. There are some suggestions given in this module. As well as where to advertise, you have to consider the advert itself. An effective job advert sells a position and the business. This is particularly important for small and new businesses because the company name may not be particularly well known. Keep the advert short and to the point and make sure it's non-discriminatory and that you avoid gender or culturally specific language. You may consider using an application form when recruiting. This means you don't rely on each candidate responding in their own way. You can be sure the candidates provide all the information that's necessary and relevant to the job. And it also makes it easier to compare like with like and make your initial assessment. The next step in the recruiting process is selecting the right candidate. First, draw up your selection criteria. It's a good idea to create a checklist based on the essential or desirable skills and experience required. Use your checklist to assess how closely candidates match up to the job and person specification. You may want to ask your business advisor or a business colleague to assist you with the selection and interview process. This helps to make sure there's no personal bias in the process and is helpful if at least one person on the selection panel has been trained in equality and diversity issues. When you have your short list of suitable people, send them a letter inviting them to an interview. Take care with the interview process. Make sure you give every candidate the same opportunities to give the best presentation of themselves, to demonstrate their suitability and to ask questions of the interviewer. Use a consistent structure for the interview too. At the end of each interview, tell the candidate what happens next and when they can expect to hear from you. When you've made your decision, notify the successful candidate but also remember to let the other candidates know that they were not successful. Finally, having made your decision and selected your candidate, there are a number of things you have to consider before they become an employee. The full details are in this module. I suggest you go through them carefully. If you follow these steps whenever you're recruiting, you'll find it more straightforward and you'll also make sure that your recruitment is efficient, effective and fair. All right, great, we're back, and that was just a good video on hiring, uh, hiring the proper way. So skills gaps, so the skills gaps in the workplace, how do you minimize that? Again, a recap, identify company objectives, survey your current employees to find out really how large that gap is or if the gap exists. Determine the A players in the organizations, these are the ones that have actually closed that gap how do they do it? Document, help, let them mentor those that are actually finding it hard to cover that skills gap. And then innovation, 
put things in place that will make innovation blossom in your organization, hire different sets of people from different backgrounds, from different uh, likes and from uh, male-female uh, ratio, as is a big thing now about um, equality of pay you get and stuff like that. And then hiring. If everything else doesn't work, you probably need to hire to cover that skill gap. And of course, when you're hiring, as, as Gabriel said, you should not hire anyone below your A players. That just doesn't make sense. Hire at the A player level or higher. Right. So I would like to share one or two things. These are some of our resources. I would like to share uh, an Analyst Plus model that we've built. And I actually have it up for you. You can download it. If you click, if you check your tool, you'll see you could click on a download link. So we've built an analyst competency model and it's a work in progress. We continue to improve that competency model. And that's what I've put for you to download. So I'll just quickly show you what we thought. Since we, we, we specialize in training analysts, we think that, okay, an analyst, when I say analyst, by the way, is any analyst, financial analyst, reporting analyst, data analyst, uh, sales analyst, I think even HR analyst, L&D analyst, in fact, I'm talking at the ATD conference, as the ATD is the Association for Talent Development. I'm talking at the conference, which is actually in a week or so's time, and the international conference in San Diego. And the topic is 10 ways Excel can make you excel in training analytics. So I'm just gonna say, okay, how would you use Excel to really do detailed training analytics? And people have been hearing about machine learning and AI. So how do you take advantage of this? So in the competency model we built, we think there are really three main pillars. There's the foundation, the foundational skills that people need, the core skills and the expert skills. Now these are technical skills for analysts. The foundational skills we think is data prep and recon. You need to data prepare your data and do detailed reconciliation. You need the essential skills there. Data analysis and reporting skills, data visualization skills, Financial analysis and fundamentals, or financial analysis fundamentals, Office 365 essential skills. So these are your foundational skills, which I think every single uh, employee needs. Then your core skills are more specialist. So things like advanced data visualization, advanced data prep, business intelligence fundamentals, advanced financial modeling, and then advanced data analysis and reporting. So those are core skills that analysts, people that consider themselves analysts need. And then if you want to go a step further and become an expert, you need financial modeling mastery, business intelligence expertise, data prep and recon expert, financial analysis expert, and then advanced analytics, which includes machine learning and AI. So this is the framework. And if you click on the link, you're able to download the entire thing. And we keep on updating this as we go. And then you can use this to build a competency model and understand certain competencies of your staff. It's quite detailed and um, you have your competency model do you need someone to be an emerging have emerging competency in a certain thing it doesn't need to be more than emerging or certain uh, positions need someone developed in that particular competency or proficient in that competency or experts so you could map this and we could help you map out your job positions based on these competency model and to add to that we have an online platform where you can do all your E all the e-learning platform we have is Office Training Hub, where you we, we basically provide all the skill sets, all these competencies and all these courses are going to be on that platform. And it's going to be much cheaper for people to uh, use that platform and build, uh, build out courses based on that platform. So Office Training Hub is the platform, and we can actually build that platform for your organization in two weeks. So you can imagine you can have an e-learning platform in two weeks. We just build it out. Exactly what we have, we build it out for you in two weeks and give you content and we continue to generate content and share that content with you. So just check that out, download it, click on the link to download and we're about to conclude. So let me quickly get back to the slides. So thanks Gabriel. Um, I just shared our competency models. Is this something that you think is useful for organizations? Um, yes, it's, it's, it's quite useful. Um, you know, um, having played in the IT environment, IT and telecoms, I can always relate to the analyst, um, you know, uh, competencies, which which is uh, you know very rich and um, 
it provides an opportunity for people to, you know, uh, today we talk about big data. Um, yes. And big data is real. So people have data, but they don't know what to do with it. And people do cannot even organize their data and all the rest of them. Not to talk of analyzing the data properly and using it. So um, I can relate with it. Yeah. Yes, I'll have to give people a, a heads up. When I visited Gabriel in his office, I mean, I was so elated because he's one of the few organizations I know uh, that are actually using nearly everything you can think about in L and D. You're, you're using MOOCs. I mean, you know what MOOCs are. You encourage your staff to do all those massive online courses, uh, LinkedIn Learning face-to-face, -face. they must do a needs analysis. You need to know whether or not this training is actually returning. There's a return on investment. So it's like the whole full scale of what a real L&D um, um, department should do for an organization. Yeah, the brains of the department and learning and training should be a culture. It should be part of the culture. So I applaud you for that, sir. And please keep up the wonderful Thank you. work. Yeah. And Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Lassan. You're welcome, sir. And you encourage some of us uh, to kind of become experts like yourself. Is there any way people can reach you? Is there some way you could share to share for people in the audience or people that have logged in to, to reach you? Yeah, okay. I'm just typing my number here. In the chat? Okay. Uh, the chat. That's nice. So please, if you look at the chat, you'll... It's one good is in the chat. I'm not putting it up in the public because that. So if you can check and 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 get the yeah. So thank you for sharing that. That's super super. Are you on Are you on Twitter and any of these social media platforms? You have a yes. I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. just your name. How would they find you on LinkedIn? Just find my name, Gabriel Mokafo. That's the that's the Excellent. man. Excellent. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm also on Twitter, so let me just share my Twitter handle with people. I'll just type that in the chat. So you could always reach me on Twitter, at the Brown Analyst. So that's my Twitter handle. And yes, so everybody, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, thanks a lot. We really, really had fun. I think we covered quite a lot today, even though we had some few technical difficulties. It's still good. It's all part of technology. And I'm just running back all the way back just so you can see all the, what we've covered so far, uh, all the tips and tricks. And next month, we still have another webinar we're going to be doing, of course. We do this every third Thursday of the month. So every third Thursday of the month, you can be sure that you'll see us. And for the training and development webinar, that's 2 to 3 o'clock, third Thursday of the month. And for the um, Excel webinar, is. 10 is 9 to 10 o'clock and the financial modeling as the Excel and Power BI webinar and then the financial modeling webinar is from 11 to 12. So thank you everybody and this was wonderful. Thanks a lot. A big, big, big thank you. Please can we all put a virtual clap for Mr. Gabriel. He was just wonderful and thank you very much for sharing your experience with us, sir. All right. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day, everybody. So thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.